Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening as we bring August Clark to read from his most recent novel, Scratch Daughters. August is a Miami alum and former Peabody Hall resident, which is where we are right now. So welcome back, August. Uh, we'll open with Miami's land acknowledgement. Uh, then I'll give you a brief overview of the many accomplishments of August. Uh, and then we will start with the reading. Miami University carries the name of the Miami people who, along with the Shawnee, were forcibly removed from these homelands. Despite centuries of colonization, the Miami people or preserve a deep connection to this land and are engaged in a vibrant resurgence of their historical language and culture, their heritage, language, and culture. The university maintains a strong reciprocal relationship with the Miami tribe of Oklahoma grounded in our shared commitment to learning and each other. To learn more, visit the Miami Center's website. Uh, my name is Jackie Dougherty, and I direct the Western Center for Social Impact and Innovation. Uh, we are Miami's interdisciplinary hub for student engagement with issues of social impact and justice. Before I give a brief welcome, uh, I want to make sure that we thank the Creative Writing Program and our physical and intellectual neighbors, the Honors College, uh, for collaborating on this event. I also want to thank Western Center's Program Coordinator, Billy Sims, who has provided both the leadership and legwork in organizing this event, as well as the many Western Center student employees involved. Scratch Daughters is Clark's second novel in the Skate Racers trilogy. A Tor Magazine review describes the novel as follows, quote, if the Skate Racers was capital Q queer, the Scratch Daughters is a massive purple neon sign, a sharp scathing sophomore novel. We will begin with August's reading, then move into a Q&A segment, uh, after which August will be available to sign books and you can purchase books outside the doors here via app or by via pay app or credit card. August has been published in Prism International, Portland Review, and Eidolon. They were a 2019 Lambda Literary Fellow in Young Adult Fiction and a Locus Award, Dragon Award, Pushcart Award, and most recently a Nebula Award nominee. They researched queerness, labor, and monstrosity at the University of Chicago. At a moment when several Ohio State House bills attempt to legislate trans children's bodies in Q plus communities out of existence in our schools, this book and reading are especially timely, although we didn't plan it like that. Some of the book's major themes serve as an antidote of sorts to such policies, including its model of intergenerational queer mentorship and the nuggets of queer history August skillfully drops for his readers. With that, let's welcome August Clark. So many gay people in one place. <laughs> okay. This is, for those who haven't read it, uh, a scene where our protagonist is riding a bike by themselves in pursuit of the part of their body that was ripped out in the first book. They are by themselves, except for the fact that they are possessed by a devil, which happens in the first book. Don't worry about it. Okay. The road round like a river, wide curves, a rack. It didn't make any sense, seeing as the road didn't pull off into different driveways or anything. It wasn't conforming to the natural shape of the landscape's ridges and hills. It just snaked around for the hell of it. And I had to keep my eyes focused dead ahead just to keep myself on the road. It seemed to get narrower. The gravel got sandier. The lack of animal life, as convincing as my theory was, seemed plausibly false all of a sudden. I couldn't hear coyotes. That didn't mean there weren't coyotes. They didn't have coyote trophies, after all. Coyotes wouldn't attack a person. But the ones in these parts had been known to maul dogs and goats from time to time. Was I really that different from a goat? I could be mistaken for a goat. The Chantry boys, that is the witch finders, would maul me first. All but Levi. He was probably still crawling, clawing at the stripe on his neck, our Chet Hex left him, horrified by his own inability to hate women without overwhelming physical pain. That was one down of four, three against one. Could I take them? There was a magical foul player the like. Guns on their end, totally, yes. I could bench whatever the eldest chantry is. They could break their faces, I get rough. Focus. I rounded another corner, eyes peeled wide. It was like the universe cracked a lamp over my head. All the colors went bright, then white hot, then rushed me. The lines that comprised everything, every tree shape and road shape and flash of horizon line became razors that flew at my eyes. 
The trees lunged from my neck and shoulders, their leafless fingers stabbed down toward my scalp. My focus tore. My body throbbed hard, not from normal spell casting or the awful blurring drain of a mimic, but something else, something different and lugging and familiar. The world was too crisp. I took in too many details. I could see every blade of grass and every bristle on every veiny oak, every swayed fold in the tree bark around me, every nodule of broken twiglets, and each bloody amber drip of sap. I gagged on a sweet smell. There was a whirling in my guts, gashes. I was seeing gashes in the trees all around me, fresh, heavy gashes, whittled like how you deface a park bench with a pen knife when you love somebody very much. The gashes shaped sigils, a metric fuck ton of sigils, all excruciatingly graphic and jammed against my brain. Sigils tucked at odd angles, just out of my line of sight, peeking behind weird branches and gill-shaped shelf mushrooms. A person in a car would have terrible advantage of them. Wouldn't notice them, but me? I could see everything. My brain was cleaving itself into minty. Beholding them was going to burst my eyes. It dawned and I wanted to scream. This was my handwriting. This was my magic. This is what she'd been carving the other day when I'd been hexing Travis Meyer on my bus. Turn it off, I panted. I swerved the handles, tried to keep on the road, but the road was covered with 10 billion sand prisms. There were infinite planes on every little crag of stone, gravel was like stars in the universe. Every sliver was different, and I could see every luminous face. I could see myself refracted off bits of dust, I could see my own shoulders reflected back at me, my face splintered across every surface that broke the night. I couldn't blink. Mr. Scratch, do something. I'm trying. Sideways, be careful, you've got to turn. A tree trunk reared up in front of me. Its torso was the size of a pencil, then the size of a python, then the size of the iceberg that killed the Titanic. I yanked my handlebars to the left, and the tires rasped and howled and veered right. The gears bolted, and I sped up. There was an incline. Everything went faster. My lungs went faster. They flew up and bent hard against my hard palate, ballooned out my nose and my ears. Huge forking trees jumped up everywhere and swung at me with twigs like bayonets. The front tire caught a rock and abruptly stopped. I did not stop. My body was suspended in air. My body was flung through space, hurtling forward through certain death, except it was taking an awfully long time to die like physics said I should. Cold tendrils shot out, twined around my extremities, bound me like ribbons on ballet shoes. The cold buoyed me upwards. It smelled inky tart. My body slowed, floated forward at a non-lethal pace, still compelled by the motion of the crash, but buffeted, controlled. I felt myself arranged upright in midair. My heart slammed against my breastbone and my brain flipped and my whole body ached like it was being wrung, but there was not any pain. The further I was carried from the road, the less I saw. I didn't feel like my head was in genuine jeopardy of being split and scrambled in the dirt. My shoes were placed on grass. Mr. Scratch fell slack inside me. Breathe sideways. You sounded warm. If a flag in a storm could speak, it'd have a voice like his. We're all right. What was that? I wrapped an arm around my stomach. There was a second I thought I'd retch, but it didn't happen. I just swayed instead. Even without the agony, I was still swimming with the feeling, the trippy, noxious hypervigilance. Those were mine. How were those mine? You know how. Madeline took them there. But why? I took a few steps forward just to prove to myself that I could. They were my sigils. I didn't think of them, but it was my soul that brought them into being. I just ought to know that they were there. I ought to be able to just read them. Or a hunch nodded up in me. Are those for spying on the Chantry House? Jesus, I get it, but why are they like that? Could be the unstable casting. Mr. Scratch took a long pause. His words felt windy. Might be a reaction your body is having to your specter as well. You and your misplaced organ aren't designed to be separate. It's not good for you being confronted with your own segmentation. It could be a psychic rejection of sorts. You're shocked by your own lack of agency over your soul and it not being in your body. And you are having an allergic reaction to the exposure. The sigils are to keep eyes on the Chantry family. You don't need extra eyes. I hacked a laugh. I wanted to scream. I can't go back up there, I said. I can't look at them. 
I'll have to loop around when I catch my breath. I still had my backpack and still had my phone safe inside it. If there was even a single star in heaven that had my back, there would be enough signal for me to GPS my way out of here. I had to count on it. We know that Madeline has been here without a doubt. That's something, isn't it? You sound like I feel. I rubbed the edge of my sleeve over my nose and took a breath. He carried me deeper into the woods and I realized how steep had that incline been. I hadn't noticed at all there had been then one up on the road. I looked over my shoulder and couldn't see the bike. And that prickled more laughter out of me. My guts ached. I was so fucked. You okay in there? I'm ragged. Give me a leave a while. I'll mend soon. I felt a twinge of guilt and a rush of something warm. If my soul was in my neck where it belonged, I might call the feeling love. I wrapped my arms around my belly, a gesture of care as much for him as for me, and took another stumble forward, rounded a particularly obstructive tree. You must have saved my life back there. Thank you. I'm undying, but as much as my life is worth, you saved mine, breaking that urn. Reciprocity is good. Besides, you're my daughter now. I wouldn't let you smash your head on a rock. I took a breath, but before I could offer him something by way of appreciation, I shut myself up. Something looked, felt different. Out of place in the rest of the blackness. Ahead of me was a hard, broad swath of darkness, not a long vertical stripe like the trees that surrounded it wide as a trailer was long. I reached behind me, fumbled around my backpack for a zipper, and yanked open just wide enough for my wrist. I plunged my hand between its teeth and pawed around for something cylindrical. There. I pulled the flashlight out, twisted it itself on, and pointed its eye toward the weird, dark shape. As soon as the light struck it, the whole thing went powder blue. Building, or physical structure, in any event. It was mostly painted, but leprous looking. Ribbons of the stuff peeled around the little angel stained glass windows. Up above was a steeple that leaned at a funny angle. Christ on his cross held the whole thing up with his left wrist, which was propped against the broken shingled roof. There was a little driveway that led up the crumbling concrete steps. The sign to the left was mossy past the point of readability. I'll be fucked. Of course it's a fucking chapel. Fuck my life. I rubbed my hands over my face. It wasn't too weird to find abandoned structures in this area. The rotten place we'd thrown that party in October, that place wasn't unique by any stretch. We were just close enough to Appalachia for that sort of thing to happen semi-regularly, particularly outside the Sycamore Gorge Incorporated limits. Things crumble around here and return to Earth. Banks don't fight to get them back. People forget them. Structures unfold. The knowledge of that, however, did not make me hate this chapel business any less. Fuck this place. No. If you sat, Mr. Scratch said, I could rest for a moment. Just a moment. I want to be helpful on the way back sideways. I can't just right now. Not like this. So, I go in the creepy church you mean. I shove my hands back in my hoodie's tube-shaped mono pocket. Just hang out in there for a little while. Casually. Yeah? Please. The doors weren't locked. They outright repelled themselves from my fingertips and left my skin flicked with chips of paint. Probably lead paint. To complement my robust bio collection of microplastics. Alrighty. I was all for exploring during the day, even if at night there <laughs> Pardon. I was all for exploring during the day. Even for it at night, provided there were better circumstances, like having friends with a video camera or having friends around generally. If my girls were here. Jane and Daisy and I would be so caught up in riling each other up and freaking the fuck out of gates that I've had no space to be scared. At present, though, as it stood, maybe this hadn't been the best idea, this whole thing. It was warmer inside the church. The worship space was as big as the gas station's interior. I brought my flashlight around slow, tried to catch the whole shape of the place. The chapel had 12 rows of pews. Shocking the cop webs, but still mostly upright, trash on the floor, empty bottles mostly, and moth-colored pages torn from prayer books, also dry rice. Maybe from a wedding? I pulled the flashlight higher. Its beam struck pupils. The walls had eyes, and I nearly bit off my tongue before I saw that I'd illuminated a stretch of framed cherub paintings that hung between each dirty window. The cherubs were all white babies, red-shaped and blue-eyed. 
Plump little hands folded in dimple of prayer. It was not people or monsters standing around the perimeter of the room watching me. Just cherubs. They were caked with mold. That's great. There were statues that matched them at the front of the room, surrounded the vacant altar. They faced the absent audience. I thought one had a bizarrely long set of eyelashes until the eyelashes shivered its little thorax and crawled away. Daddy long legs. A little surprise from entropy to me. I tried to think of something mean and picky to say about Mr. Scratch. Because what the fuck? But the lingering guilt and gratitude amalgam in my gut left over from him saving my life stopped me from actually actualizing it out loud. Did he read my thoughts? Only sometimes. Rest up, I growled. I made my way down the aisle, unduly conscious of every creak and rustle my boots made across the rotten carpet. The thing had been red once, but it's brown now. The bench Mr. Scratch had wanted was right underneath an enormous crucifix. Moldy white jeans and eyes were clouded glass marbles. They looked like mimics. There was a vague thought in the back of my head about the crooked steeple, and by extension the state of the structural integrity of this chapel after fuck knows how long that sat without tending, and the thought was bad. Every step I took was a chance that I'd startle the building and make it fall on my head. It's not going to fall on your head. I tried to ignore him. His commentary wasn't helping. I swept the flashlight beam back and forth over the ground, let it sway with my stride. The longer I walked, the farther back the altar seemed. The chapel accordion felt like a bad high. Rice crunched under my boots. I held the light up again, illuminated the dangling Jesus' chest. Somebody had written something around where his top surgery scars might be. I squinted, craned my neck. Pugnantes de un animus. Something crinkled up underfoot. Louder than a leaf, that was for sure. I jerked the light down and took my foot off the unopened bag of chips that just crushed. It wasn't dusty or grimy, it was new. Salt and vinegar, freshly smudged with mud. It was tucked against the corner of the last pew, lay beside two empty cans of garbanzo beans and an empty water jug. I opened my mouth to say something to Mr. Scratch, something like, huh, that's weird, and not something that would normally just be in the church. One of the pews creaked behind me. I heard breathing. My knife was in my bag. It was in the pocket of my bag, and that pocket was nowhere near where my hand rested now. Why did I put it so far out of reach? I seized a Bible off the floor and rolled around, wound it back. My non-Bible hand fumbled until it aimed my flashlight in the breathing's direction. It caught a human face. I couldn't make out the features at first. Pale hair and pale skin, a pale hand thrown over pale eyes, a scowl twisting over pale lips. The flashlight bleached whatever color existed there, if there was even color there. It left this person looking ghostly and plain. Then the person shifted. They rose to their feet. The sheet they'd been lying beneath tumbled off their body, and they wore a white shirt underneath, whitewashed jeans. Chantry boy. Reflex took over. I hurled the Bible out of space. He caught it one-handed, gingerly dropped it on the pew he'd been lying on. Don't, he said. His voice was thick, raw-sounding. He'd been screaming or was sick. Just don't. Which chantry are you? I slapped around my back pocket until I found a handle, yanked it out, switched it open. The knife blade looked blue in the slide. Answer me. I'm not. The boy coughed a laugh, eased himself back down into a pew. He put his skull in his hands. I saw, I saw his shoulders move under his shirt. He was breathing funny. Caleb, to answer your question. He looked up after a moment, peered at me from between his fingers, rat poison blue eyes. You're that girl we found by the pool. What are you doing here? You evil fuck. I heaved myself forward, slammed the sole of my boot square in the middle of his ribs. The force shoved him back, pinned him against the pew. I remembered him. This was the Parker who carried me up the chantry. Sh <laughs> I love alliteration so much. And to what end? This was the fucker who carried me up the chantry stairs and oh so gently arranged for the removal of my fucking soul. I felt the air clap out of his mouth. His eyes shot wide and he seized the leather around my ankle, but his leverage was shit and I was leaning all of my weight onto my heel. He gasped. His eyes fixed on the tip of my knife. They followed it back and forth as I waved it around. Rancid candy blue, Adderall blue, anti food blue. Were you waiting for me? Did you come looking for me? He wasn't supposed to be able to do that. 
The stock knocks about with scapegracers that put up against the chantry as I had a felt it break. What if I can't feel spells break? Fuck. I curled my lips over my teeth. Speak up. What are you doing here? He panted, struggled to pull a breath down his throat. I saw the whites of his eyes. When the words wouldn't come, he shook his head, curled his mouth. A grimace? A sneer? An ugly, dismissive smile? And released my ankle. Held the splayed fingers by either side of his head like, don't cut me, I'm unarmed. Hair hung in his eyes. It looked stringy, almost wet. Is that Caprice? I sniffed. There was something sour about this situation, something itching at me. I looked down by the cans of my ankles, the water jug, the chips I'd ruined. I looked at the pew he'd been sleeping on, the sheet he'd been wrapped in, the suitcase that I now noticed had been propped between the pew and the wall. Well, I'll be damned, I said. Slowly, in a move that made my heart hurt a little, I took my boot off his ribs. He lurched forward, folded his spine into a candy cane shape, and sputtered a breath. He wrapped his arms around his stomach, rubbed his mouth with his wrist. Obviously, which? Which with a knife, watch your fucking tone. I curled my lip, but given the context, I decided not to kick him again. Not yet. They threw you out, huh? Felt obvious enough, but it didn't make any sense. I knelt, picked up the chip back, crinkled it between my fists. Why? Caleb didn't say anything for a moment. Set his jaw on a hard line, then in this stoic. I shook myself. Even without my soul in my teeth, I felt a phantom rush of anger. I wanted to break my hands on his face. I can make that jaw move. The anger passed as quick as it came, though, looking at the chip bag. Fucking empathy, come to ruin my life. I felt caught in stuff and strange. How'd you escape? He fixed his eyes on me. When we caught you, you vanished. Was it the window? I snorted affirmatively. That was a steep drop. You could have broken your neck. He said this matter-of-factly. His monotone was resonant, hard-edged enough to push through all the grit in his voice. Why would you come back this way, Rich? Why are you sleeping in a death trap, bootlicker? He blinked. I was thrown out, as you said. Why? Why do you care, Sideways? Don't talk to him. He's a chantry boy. His blood and his bones are evil. He was bred to break my daughters. I want him not to be alive. Let me eat him. Please let me eat him. I would never be too tired not to eat him. I had no idea how that would work, and didn't presently care to find out. Caleb just looked at me. Against all my screaming instincts, I sat down on the pew beside him. Not next to him, not close enough to touch, but still. We were at eye level now. I kept my knife out, but tucked it against my thigh out of sight. Question for a question? He scissored his fingers shut, hit his eyes. Didn't negate me, though. He said, what did you do to Levi? Cursed him that he'd be in pain every time he thought about hurting women. He had it coming. Caleb didn't negate that either. He leaned back a little, pulled his face off his hands, closed his eyes. He was waiting, I realized. It was my turn. I chewed my tongue. How long have you been here? Four days. He closed his eyes and then opened them wide. How'd you find this place? Accident, literally. Where the fuck are we? It was a Baptist chapel a few decades ago, I think. Batterson copycat denomination. He fixed his eye on the graffiti of glass-eyed Jesus. My brothers and I played in here as kids. Spectacular how much I hated that. He said, did my brother hurt you? I mean, you all fucking kidnapped me. I rubbed my teeth on the inside of my collar, tried to free myself of the memory's taste. It smelled like mildew in here. But no, he hurt somebody I know, Lila Yates specifically. There was an impulse that fired in my head, and I followed it. I fished around my backpack for the chain and pulled it out. Caleb's look sharpened. Something flickered behind his eyes. He leaned toward me, and a few lank locks of hair fell across his nose, and he didn't move to shove them aside. I thought his face might twitch might make a human expression, but it didn't. Unreadable. How do you know Madeline Klein? It's my turn. I pulled that up a little. He knew things about Madeline. He might know how to find her. I needed to know that I could trust him, though. I needed assurance that he wouldn't be leading me into his family's jaws, regardless of whether or not they were close at the moment. I licked my gums, clenched my fists tighter. I said, why did your parents throw you out? 
tail and shoulders tense, his whole body did. The veins in his arms stood out like blue worms. He stared at the floor, and after a moment, he opened his mouth and said, I write journals every night. My brother David read them. Showed my father something he knew he wouldn't like. He opened his mouth, but only a thin watery sound escaped it. His brows came together. They peeped upwards, and he shut his eyes again. Pushed his mouth into a line. Color gleamed in the piece of his cheeks, around his eye sockets, in the meat of his pursed lips. The splotches flushed a deep pink. He pressed his hands over his face, potted like he could get the blood to flow backwards. He nudged the mushroom tears back into their ducts. Why do you care anyway? Oh, so he's gay, huh? <laughs> and then they become friends. <laughs> All right, I think we're ready for some Q&A. Cool. Uh, for the folks that are For the folks that are with us in the theater, um, if you just want to stand up, I think there's a small enough group to speak out, and then I'll paraphrase if anybody needs to. And then we also have some folks joining us online. I like questions. I'm not scared. <laughs> We do have a question online that, uh, yeah, somebody sent earlier. Was there any magical systems from history that inspired the magical systems in the book? Mm. So when I wrote this, circa being 19 or whatever, I was really interested in, I mean, I was a classic student for all my sins. So I was interested in sort of the herbalism that was understood to be magic at the time. At the time being the entire period of antiquity. Magic was a very drugs and medicine based understood phenomenon. And then there was divine phenomena that was separate. But I was more interested in how poetry felt to read aloud than I was in actual magic systems that I was studying at the time. I think that the magic lineage of scapegracers is less historical and more uh, the sugar rush feeling you get when you are at a hyper pop concert, you know? Um, I really like effective extremity, and I also really like historical research, but the historical research for this book is almost all about queerness and less about witchcraft. It's a lot of historical witchcraft is not actually historical witchcraft. Probably not there. A follow-up question on that uh, from an online audience member is, um, how does being queer change or challenge how witchiness is intertwined with womanhood? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so, there's a scene in the third book where this is discussed, so we have to promise to only post this online if we care about spoiling the third book, which I'm not going to stop you even under. Um, this series presupposes that power is a real substance that we are moving through all of the time, and that power can ossify to make social structures, and that people who are abraded by those social structures form a callus, which is your specter, which is the thing you use to cast magic as an organ in your body. In the third book, we learn more about, and I think actually in Scratch Shutters too, the very evangelical group of witch finders, the brethren, who understand this organ that forms to be their words for methodizing. It is an extra organ that is not an organ reflected in the bodies of Adam or Eve, right? Um, I am really, really interested in gender as phenomenological 
and materially bounded, not in ways that are reflective of even like roles, but more what are we actually actively doing with each other. And when we come into contact with others, and we are with others, something is produced, and that something is sometimes gendered. And I think witchcraft in this series, because it's all effective extremity, right? And like what happens if my abrasion with the powers that be is such that when I feel really strongly something fucking happens, there's some gender that goes on, I think automatically in that, because it changes how we are with others. Um, Sideways comes out in this book. Sideways is a non-binary lesbian, forward slash a butch dyke, right? Um, whose gender is all about being a dyke and very little about kind of neat and tidy gender definition, right? Um, many lesbians, myself included, understand our gender as being relational with other lesbians, right? I am what I am because I am with others. And without others, I'm inscrutable. I don't know if that was a legible answer, but it is how I think about it. So, yeah. I got a related question. Yeah. That it's naive, but I'll let it out. So, you're a gifted storyteller. Why is it so important, or why is it important to frame this, frame yourself as an author of gay fiction mm. rather than great storytelling? I think Can I rephrase that just for a second sure. for the folks online? I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt. Uh, as, as a queer author, why is it important for you to frame your work as such? Okay. So I think that the really stupid, simple answer is because my work is gay. Um, but I mean that formally and structurally and linguistically. Um, I try to have a story structure in Escape Racer, Scratch Shotters in the third book. His title isn't officially an out. It's Peacemakers. You don't know that yet. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is secret. I'm the chance to tell my editors that I've told you. Um, the structure of these books is all about following emotional arcs and relational arcs and isn't super traditionally plotted. Um, with all of my work, I am really interested in exploring what it means to have a story whose foundation is queer. Not just a story who has queer characters, um, capaciously queer characters. Those are lovely stories, and I think that they are not as challenging as I want them to be. Uh, I think queer form, we can go really poetic directions with. But I think that we can also, with traditional prose, have story styles that just are queer in some fundamental way. I feel like postmodern literature discussions talk about uh, the climax in a traditional story arc is following like male pleasure, like build up, climax, fall, right? Resolution. And there have been conversations about what would a female orgasm story structure look like. And I think that those conversations are a little overdetermined and silly, but it raises, it allows for the possibility of us to ask, what does it mean to write a dyke story? that is that, and is inextricable from being that. Uh, what does it mean if we write prose in a way that is distinctly and uniquely queer, regardless of the relationships the characters might find themselves in, right? So that is why it's important to call myself an author of gay fiction, because it is fiction that is gay, like it is gay. Also, it's full of gay people, <laughs> for sure. Mine? What color is your specter? <laughs> the thing about specter colors is they don't mean anything. They're just fun. <laughs> I'm really, a lot of this is like magical girl rules, where like it's a fun color because it is, because colors are fun. They don't symbolize anything. So mine, mm -mm. let's say like a really, <laughs> I'm going to say like a baby blue. Yeah. That's what my gut says. There was another hand coming. Um, you talked earlier about how your magic system relies on institutions, sort of a callous within this institution. Yeah. Do you feel like 
with like in queer communities and queer spaces, I feel like we have this growing like rigidity um, and like increase yeah, on the importance of like really specific labels. You have to say you're this or you can't be that. Um, do you feel like if that progressed within your world, the callus could also form against the institutions of queer spaces? So uh, to recap for online homies, uh, it is a question about whether the granularity and rigidity of identity, politics, and labels in queer spaces would become, assuming the, the world building of magic in this trilogy, um, could become another stricture against which one could chafe and form a sector. I think, so I think this is qualified by the fact that there is already the initial structure that one has to rub against necessarily to enter into this space, right? Um, but I think that ignoring that, like putting that aside, for that to be the case, there one has to be enough consolidated power inside of the community, which we're assuming is a homogenous community, for that power to be wielded successfully. We are very good at doing this in small social spaces, and we are very good at doing this on Twitter.com. But uh, I think that that kind of reactionary, anxious, like paranoid mode of managing the identities of people around you to provide a structure for your own tends to fall apart in real queer spaces in real life um, because we have real things to worry about, right? I was once interviewed by a very sweet high schooler who asked me how it was that I could be a Hebe lesbian and that be fine. And the thing about that is nobody fucking cares, actually. Um, and the reaction against that is an insecurity about defending one's own water rate from viable edges. And I just really am not interested in entertaining uh, that kind of insecurity. I can support capacious you, non specific you, uh, by fighting for you to get resources, by partying with you at a club, by standing with you when we stand against our common oppressors. But I am really just not interested in uh, turning our attention toward making ourselves legible for outside observers. It gets us nowhere. And also, outside observers who don't like us don't care and think that we're being silly because we are. Um, so the answer to the world building question is, I don't think it would because necessarily we already have the conditions to have a spectral form. And also the queers who are doing this are queers that are not community leaders because queers who are community leaders care about community. And people who are doing this generally don't. They care about their own anxieties. Does this make sense? Yes, it does. Word. Christine. So. Um, is witchcraft in your book like a well-known thing or is it more like a secrecy? Uh, so we all in, in this room have heard of witchcraft, yes? <clears throat> and if I said there was a witch in your class, even if you don't think that that has like metaphysical actual meaning, you'd be like, yeah, okay. I think that that's kind of how this works here. Um, everyone knows what's going on because they are all familiar with the generic world building of being a guy who knows what a witch is. Uh, I don't think that the metaphysical as material reality of the novel is widely known by everyone, which is why Sideways discovers more as Sideways meets more people and finds community. But it's also not like a secret. Nobody is doing Harry Potter style masquerades um, because I find that tedious and tiresome and also goofy. Uh, because if I had witchcraft, I would put it on Reddit. <laughs> and so does Sideways. We have a question from Alex online. Alex asks, talk to me about striking the balance between the intangibility nature of gender, sexuality, queerness, with the physicality of power and magic. How do you balance defining the rules with the inexplic inexplicable? Okay. I think that <coughs> those two categories are already not concrete and discrete. I think that gender and sexuality are tangible and also ephemeral, 
and immaterial at the same time. I think that power is and is not tangible at the same time. I think that witchcraft in this context, in the context of this story, is and is not tangible at the same time. I try really, I'm quite interested in sideways having a little gay panic attack feeling prosaically the same as sideways doing magic, because I think that they are the same. I think that the physiological state of feeling intensely and discovering desire or discovering love or all of these things is materially the same in the books as externalizing that and doing magic. Um, there is the fact that like gender is weird and fake and bad and great. And these books don't really set out to concretize what gender is, because I will not be doing that. But I do think that the interplay is very, very close and intentional. Also very vague answer. I have no idea if that was intelligible. That's about where I'm at. Yeah. <coughs> Does anyone have a really stupid question? <laughs> so. OK, so your last editor, Cloud Talk. Oh, all right, my last Asian Clown College story. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, so once upon a time, I went to Miami University of Ohio. <laughs> um, I wrote a book when I was a freshman, which was Gay Bracers. And I went on literary London to study abroad and I sent out some query letters and I got an agent. Yay. They were great. And they were my agent for years and years and years. They sold Gay Bracers. They were with me when I wrote two other manuscripts while I was here. Uh, they started negotiating the deal for things you don't know about that I'm going to gesture towards over here that you don't know about because it's not online yet. Um, they were really, really wonderful. And I loved them so much. We both found out that we were butch at the same time. It was really great. One day they wrote to me a little letter. And in the letter it said, Dear August, I hope you're doing well. I regret to inform you that I am leaving the industry because I have found my true passion and have enrolled in an intensive theater and clown school to become a clown. And like, I love that for them. <laughs> but also, your agent, when one agent puts on their big red shoes, <laughs> and climbs into their little car <laughs> and drives away from you. It's hard. <laughs> um, she like they could have they could have died. Is the thing they could have done? They could have just said, "I'm leaving the industry." That happens all the time. If you get a literary agent, they're probably going to leave at some point because it's a really hard field, and also people's lives change, and it's super normal and okay. Um, if they had said, "I'm getting into theater," cool. <laughs> It was the like the clownness. <laughs> it really, um, made me feel like I was actually hallucinating. So I like walked around my day job and had other coworkers like read a lot of the emails to me, and all of them would read the email, and then their faces would like change and expand, and all of us like started laughing uncontrollably. And then I went home and had a little minty B about the fact that my agent was a clown, and immediately DM'd an agent whom I followed on Twitter who had never read my work before just because um, like she's cute and I'm cute and that's why we followed each other. And I said, hi, my agent's a clown. Uh, you're, you're an agent. I'm an author. You're fam, I'm butch. Like, would you like to take a commission off of my next contract? She was like, that. <laughs> and now I'm just my agent. Um, anyway, that's the story of how my agent went to Khan College. Uh, and got a girlfriend immediately upon becoming a Khan. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it would have been like if I had learned later. <laughs> like, I do now. Like for me now, fear of puns is a fear of abandonment thing. <laughs> if I had found out about it in retrospect, like, oh, my agent's at the industry, okay, I have to deal with this, that's fine. And then I like check their Twitter and they're just 
your Twitter profile has some written notes. <laughs> Actually, in real life. Um, I just don't know what I would have done. I still don't know what to do about it sometimes. It's fine. A difficult question. <laughs> oh, we're just going to leave you to stand with my clownist, which would be acceptable and understandable. Not as fun of a question, mm -hmm. professor question. Um, so you wrote this as a you wrote your first novel as a freshman yeah. in college. What? I wrote my first novel when I was sixteen. The one I got an agent for, I wrote when I was a freshman. Okay. Here it comes. What advice would you give aspiring writers <laughs> in college? Well, <coughs> the first thing is. Uh, if you want to be a novelist, who wants to be a novelist? Okay, so like a, a fistful of you. Okay, word. Um, it's a market industry, right? So if you decide what I want to do is make my art a commodity object, word. You're, I would learn to write really prolifically and often. And to get really used to silence and no. Because uh, there's a lot of that. But also, you have to, like, to be an author, you one, have to think highly enough of yourself to think that other people should care about your daydreams. And two, have to be the kind of person who can hear no over and over and over again for years. I had a pretty normal timeline for rejections. It's just I did it young, right? Like, it took me two manuscripts before Skate Racers to figure out how to write a book. Just skate racers. And then after I wrote Skate Racers, it was on sub for fucking forever. So I wrote two more books. And one of them was really ready to go on sub instead of Skate Racers. And then Skate Racers sold, right? But it is an industry with a lot of waiting. And that's just going to have to be a thing you get used to. Um, the industry is really tight and really disheartening. And really great, you kick some fits. Uh, you don't have to do it by yourself. You don't have to query by yourself. There are so many people who are also doing this, and you can be in community with them, which is really great. And it means sometimes you have a whole cohort of new authors who get agented right around the same time. And you have a community to work with. I didn't do that. You don't have to do it like me. You also don't have to write a book when you're at school. I'm insane. And you don't have to do that. Um, I don't know how I did it. Like a mathematically, I don't know how that made sense, but I did when I was here. Because I had three majors <laughs> and was also the two term president of Spectrum. Is anyone here in here in Spectrum? Okay, we're. I ruled Spectrum with an iron fist. Uh, my club. Um, so I was busy as hell. I don't know how it happened, but it did because I'm insane. You don't have to be like that. You can take your time, right? Like there's no rush. The industry is hopefully oh, not going anywhere. So like, persevere and figure out what a book is. It's not obvious. It took me a while to figure out what a book is. I just started young. It's lucky I'm insane. Yes. Hi, Hi. Hi. Wonderful to see you. So I'm wondering, this book that you wrote in your freshman year and published, what, three years ago, two years ago? Skate Pressers? Yeah. Uh, well, anyway. <laughs> it doesn't matter. The, the question is, how much revision did you end up doing, mm -hmm. and how much of it was purely self-directed, and how much of it was because somebody asked you to make this revision? Sure. So, Skate Racers had one round of developmental edits, and then a round of line edits. Um, developmental edits are, you write a book, you give it to me. I'm your editor. I say, the third act is really weird. I need you to expand it and to make it hit these score of time beats. I think that'll work better. Also, can you change something about the dynamic between these two characters? Like those sort of substantive, you're going to have to actually produce new material changes. You say, work, and you do it, and you give it back to me. Line edits are when I say, this paragraph I would like to be structured like this. I'm changing these words around here, this, this, and this. Are you game? You say yes or no. When you turn it back to me, having given me your yes or no's, I give it to a copy editor who checks for grammar and syntax, basically. Um, 
I am not someone who's ever had extensive developmental edits. I am also not someone who writes in drafts. I write one manuscript from top to bottom and I turn it in. Um, because Apollo has punished me with the gift of um, prophecy forward slash gay level stories and they come to me fully formed and then I vomit them up on the page and hand them to people. I asked because the book does not read like something that a first year college student would normally write. It's much better than that. So I just wondered you know, how much your writing style changed over that time. I'm strong. Like, I think it's very apparent to me where my weaknesses were in when I was young enough to write skate racers. Um, my command of metaphor was much looser. I had really good impulses and my instincts were strong but I just wasn't as deft with placing the word down. Um, I'm excited for you to read the things you're not allowed to know about. Because my is substantially stronger and that I wrote it as an adult with a fully formed prefrontal cortex. <laughs> it's huge for me. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question, if anybody has one. Twenty-five. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so like old enough that I have to start thinking about health insurance. Oh. Yeah. And that's the thing to know if you become an author is yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. Um, look for second jobs. Become an author. You need a day job or you'll die. <laughs> what is your day job? I'm a bookseller. Um. Which is great, mostly, except it is also retail. Um, however, I am the expert of time theft. I'm so good at it. So it's mostly really fun. Um, I also do a lot of favors. Gigs, we could say. Uh, so someone will say, I need coffee for this, and I will write it. Or I need you to carry this up the stairs, and I will do it. These sorts of things. And if you put them together, you can pay rent and live inside. Yeah. Um, okay, we're going to close this portion of the event out tonight. Uh, thank you so much to August Clark for sharing your work with us. Uh, August will be available uh, to sign your books at the podium after we wrap up here. Uh, and Scratch Daughters, as well as Scape Gracers, are available for purchase right outside the theater doors via credit card or pay app. Um, and if you're interested, shameless plug, in learning a little bit more about how to keep books like Scratch Daughters and Scape Gracers uh, about queer and BIPOC youth available to kids in Ohio classrooms, please join our colleagues at Miami Stripple Fund Committee tomorrow at 1230 at Markham. Um, as we will give a workshop on activism uh, to resist the Ohio State Legislature's moves against these sorts of things. And lastly, I think this is an appropriate wrap up. Uh, we'll end with something that August recently said about Scratch Daughter's main characters during an interview with Firehouse Books. Quote, I think that our potential to love each other is boundless and has great revolutionary potential. Have a great rest of the night. Thank you.